coming. Um, uh, I know that dinner is more important than diaspora, but obviously not for you, and that's great. Well, um, uh, first of all, to say something, I'm the historian here, and I uh, was on some other panels, and I saw that they were completely dominated by theologians, so um, excuse me if I do not really speak the language of the theologians, though I'm trying to think myself in it. Um, uh, and if my questions are not the ones um, uh, theologians usually pose. Um, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> when um, uh, Father Ciprian um, uh, invited me to this panel, I thought, well, I'm not really uh, somebody working on diaspora, though it, it happens sporadically when working on you know, uh, religious questions in the former Yugoslavia. Um, and some work was connected to the Russian immigration, and some was connected to um, uh, religious community, well, religious communities of um, the Serbs and the Croats in Austria and in Germany <coughs> during Yugoslav communism. So I sort of tried to put this together, and I tried to find a good introduction for this. And the introduction I just took from my, you know, personal experience. And in 2008, well, my wife is from Saratov in Russia, and she is Orthodox, and through her I also have this, uh, you know, uh, personal connection uh, with um, Orthodox diaspora. Because she goes to the um, um, parish, um, or um, uh, yeah, the, the cathedral church um, of the um, Moscow Patriarchy in Berlin, uh, and one of their priests in 2008 uh, became famous or infamous for consecrating a Jewish kippah. Um, well, this caused various rumors in the, um, uh, among the believers. There were those saying that this was a shame, something impossible to do, and that the, the bishop should punish him for that. But there were also others, among them my wife, who said, well, uh, what kind of an interesting and, uh, you know, unorthodox orthodox priest this was, you know, showing his breadth and, you know, big heart uh, for uh, persons of um, various religions. In that very same year, also in 2008, <clears throat> and me and my wife and our children went to our um, um, just purchased uh, apartment in Engels uh, on the eastern side of the Volga River in Russia. So um, since we just had moved into that apartment, at that time we would spend lots of time in Russia, um, she wanted a priest to consecrate this apartment. Well, um, and then, who came was a monk, uh, probably 10 years younger than I am, or was then um, 35 years old. And after uh, having finished the consecration, he sat down in the kitchen for a tea, um, and then he, well, he started to inquire about my religious affiliation. I told him I was a Lutheran. Well, the next thing he said was that we do not have a real priesthood. And uh, but not only that, even worse, that we were starting to consecrate women. Well, in the end, I um, whispered to my wife, what well, can we get rid of him? Um, well, we got rid of him, finally, because every sort of consecration at a certain point ends. Um, and when you left the, the apartment, I said, well, you know, how comes they feel so powerful when they are at home? Because that was after the Kippa story in Berlin. So um, the question was whether these two stories sort of um, um, help to understand the different situations of a priest in the diaspora uh, and a priest uh, in the home camp country. Well, I think we basically we all believe that the diaspora situation means um, a need for accommodation, for mediation and tolerance, um, while being a priest in the home country may mean being drawn into politics, into state building, into the demarcation of national boundaries, or also in the, into the dominance of the main ethnic group or the titular nation. Um, uh, Russian Orthodox theology um, uh, in the 20th century reached, reached its peak in our environment, environments which were dominated but needed by other confessions. So it was not in the homeland situation, but it happened in the diaspora situation. Uh, that is when the emigres felt a need to preserve and develop their distinct culture through the church, but also to explain this culture and its potential to a secularist, Catholic, or Protestant environment. Um, 
one can discuss, you know, in the longer historical line, whether there was a similar situation of high productivity in early modern times, when, for example, uh, the orthodox schooling system was built up in Polish-dominated um, Ukraine, um, or in Habsburg-dominated Vojvodina, uh, when all these structures, such as seminaries and ac academies, were um, uh, created to uh, counterpose something to the Jesuit threat. Um, mainland orthodoxy <clears throat> partly acknowledges uh, the contributions of the diaspora, but I think it is uh, not wrong when I, if I say that it is still keen to underline that the diaspora is subordinated to the motherland and that the church diaspora should be ruled from patri patriarchies in the country of origin. This is what, what was basically what the discussions in Crete were about. Um, an important issue for the clergy in uh, modern state, uh, modern secular environments is always uh, maintaining the faith. Um, uh, and in the diaspora situation, this means the activity of the clergy, of parishes, orthodox education, and usually this is done without the help of the state, in an environment which tends to assimilate the younger generations and, you know, draw them away uh, from this diaspora culture. Thus. The driving force here is always the fear of disappearance of the group, which can only be count countered by church activity. Uh, in the home country, maintaining faith can also, be, can also mean relying on completely different means, for example, relying on the state, which keeps religious competitors at bay. Uh, in times of uh, secularization, that is in our times, um, missionary or pastoral activity learned in the diaspora but diaspora may be important for the homeland as well, but I'm not so sure whether this is always acknowledged back there, and probably you know the answer better than I do. Um, what I can tell you today as a historian who has worked on the um, Russian Orthodox Church in interwar Yugoslavia is that the way diasporas develop frequently depends very much on the concrete environment which the emigres enter. And I would like to illustrate this with a short comparison between the situations in interwar Yugoslavia and France. The Russian immigration in the 1920s um, uh, in, came to Yugoslavia um, and were there uh, in that new country uh, institutionally um, uh, extremely important. Uh, that is, uh, the Russian structures were important for all of the Russian immigration worldwide. Because here, the Russian Orthodox Church uh, abroad um, uh, came to settle with a synod in the tiny town of Sremsky Karlovsi. And uh, what also came was the military leadership under General Wrangel, uh, who spent uh, basically uh, a larger part of the 1920s also in Yugoslavia, keeping all the military stru structures um, of the white armies intact. Um, but culturally, on a global scale, much more important was the Russian immigration in Paris. Um, for sure, both immigrations had their theologians, their church historians, their religious intelligentsia. Uh, but only the one in Paris, with its great names such as Bulgakov, Flarovsky, Afanasyev, Meindorf, and so on, was the one that gave the great impulses for world theology. Uh, though there were important uh, theologians in the Balkans, they did not become that type of center. So the question is why this happened. Um, <clears throat> the two main keys are, first of all, the long-standing prestige of the West and of France in particular uh, in Russian educated society. But also the non-orthodox, the secularist, liberal, but also Catholic char character of French society. Yugoslavia <coughs> is a country with a relative orthodox majority as culturally much more close, but exactly this closeness meant the specific, that the specific stimuli of the Paris situation were lacking there. Um, France's prestige, its relative wealth, and its openness for migration soon made Paris by far the largest Russian community in Europe. And in the early 1930s, Paris and its surroundings uh, counted somewhere between 40,000 and 50,000 uh, so-called Russians, which were uh, in reality comprised of other nations as well, but it's hard to count that. While um, all of Yugoslavia had just about 30,000 at the same time, dispersed all over the whole east of uh, the country. On from the mid-1920s, the Russian intelligentsia clearly preferred France 
uh, not only to Berlin, but also to Belgrade, um, where intellectual life was considered far less interesting. The preference for France is not so self-evident because there were important pluses uh, uh, for in the Yugoslav situation for the emigres. Uh, the Serbs had a friendly attitude uh, compared to the mere curiosity, but then also the disinterest after a certain time of the French public. Uh, in Yugoslavia, there was a possibility to enter state service. That is, um, the theologians in Belgrade became professors of the uh, theological faculty. Russian priests could, uh, could take over regular Serb parishes and receive state pay. And the same is true for engineers, lawyers, and others who, who could also enter Yugoslav state service. Um, but there was a certain price for this type of integration. That is, the Russian intelligentsia and its energies in Yugoslavia were employed for solidifying Yugoslav institutions, and the Russians had to deliver what the Serbs expected. In France, no such service was foreseen. Uh, the Russians were seen in general just as labor force, uh, no matter, matter what type of labor, and it is well known that many of them worked in very hard physical labor, which did not correspond at all to their uh, education. The religious uh, intelligentsia was, as long as they could find any type of means for living, free to create, but also forced to create in a surrounding society that seemed somewhat inimical to the Russian's core identity, either by its secularism or by its Catholicism. I guess that, it was an, that this was an important impulse for developing orthodox thought as a mechanism of defense in a situation uh, where there was no orthodox state to protect them and no orthodox state to limit them either. Uh, the extremely influential uh, um, search of uh, Georgi Florovsky uh, for hidden westernizations of orthodox thought, which he wanted to get rid of, hints to just that. And at the same time, um, uh, this tendency uh, of the interwar theology of the Russians did not prevent fruitful cultural dialogue since Russian emigre theologians continued to follow and integrate into their own thinking elements of Western theology and philosophy, but basically not to merge it with Western culture, but always to vitalize it and to help Russians to survive in this type of situation. Yugoslavia, with its cultural closeness and its considerable generosity in granting Russian schools, there were schools just for Russians and their diploma were recognized within Yugoslavia, um, in comparison, did not pose a similar threat of, of cultur cultural disappearance and consequently did not provoke this type of creativity either. Uh, for Serb politicians and churchmen, uh, the Russians uh, were to help the Serbs to rule, to penetrate the country, to be a counterweight against the Croat Catholic intelligentsia. This meant that the Russians could easily enter a predefined role, but this meant also a limitation for their freedom. They had a concrete task, which was to lift, when we talk about theologians, uh, Serb Orthodox theology to levels uh, which had been reached, let's say, in late Tsarist Russia. Uh, and they did not have to worry so much about being overwhelmed and assimilated by a uh, majority culture, uh, because uh, here in the Yugoslav case, it was close anyway, and it showed a considerable readiness to accept Russians, especially in church matters, uh, as important players, even as authorities, though they had lost their homeland. Um, excuse me. <coughs> important is also the difference between the Russian ecclesiastical leadership in the two countries. While the Parisian metropolis under Yevlogi Georgievsky preferred the jurisdiction of the Patriarchy of Constantinople, which was not interested in predetermining uh, the direction of theologizing, the Synod of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad in Sremsky Karlovci saw itself as the true uh, Russian Church loyal to the principles of a Russian Orthodox autocratic state, which they were planning to re erect as soon as the possibility would come. Its first metropolitan, Antoni Krapovitsky, uh, was an interesting and devoted uh, spiritual leader, but he was frequently an enemy of theological creativity especially if he suspected heterodox <coughs> inspirations taken from the West. And in this way, he was definitely a continuation of the state Russian church um, in late Tsarist Russia, uh, which was not really a great stimulus for creativity. Um, the importance 
and meaning of diaspora uh, can be described from various angles, by the way. Uh, for so far, far, I have created the impression that living in the diaspora means basically becoming more open, flexible, and tolerant for <coughs> other nations and religions, but also mo and more culturally creative. This impression is wrong, or it is one-sided. Um, diasporas, including religious diasporas, can be extremely important for national movements in the homeland. This is basically the sense of the word diaspora. Um, uh, and they can even help to spark and finance wars of liberation in the homeland. This is, it is well known um, from le national liberation movements in the 19th century's Balkans, uh, where, for example, Greeks in Odessa uh, played a key role for the uh, Greek War of Independence. Things were quite similar at the end of the 20th century, uh, when diaspora communities of Serbs, Croats, and Albanians greatly helped national movements in the homeland and supported war efforts of their particular side. To do so, the diaspora communities, which very frequently centered around uh, religious parishes, did not even have to renounce what they had learned in the liberal and post-national West. Rather, they portrayed, propagandistically often, their own war to be defending Europe while the opposing nations and their leaders were portrayed as the enemies of European values. Um, there is a nice paradox in this story. As I tried to show in my work on orthodoxy and Catholicism in communist Yugoslavia, the Croat Catholic diaspora was um, much more effective in its long-distance nationalism than the Serb Orthodox than the Serb Orthodox diaspora, though the Orthodox undoubtedly had a more solid tradition of sacralizing the nation than the universalist. Catholics, which had detected the power of merging religion and nation only in the early 20th century. So how comes this? Um, as the other Orthodox churches, the Serbian Orthodox Church had been too weak to resist communist, communist politics of marginalization in Yugoslavia. By the 1950s, the state had managed to minimize church influence on the, urban, urban, um, on the educated urban population, and had brought the hierarchy under the control of the state security. Uh, with the homeland church extremely weakened, only the, the diaspora remained as a source of anti-communist resistance. Uh, but uh, through its influence on the patriarch, the, sta the state or the Belgrade government managed to create a schism uh, in the diaspora be be between those obeying the Bel Belgrade patriarchy and those who thought that the patriarch, the patriarch, had become a servant of the communists. When, from the late 1960s, Serb workers started to flow to Western Europe, uh, they were not only quite secularized already, but also find, found their st church structures in deep disarray, so that the religious diaspora was improbable to become a powerful factor of long-distance anti-communism and nationalism. In this sense, the Croat Catholic diaspora proved to be more effective. Croat Catholic bishops, disciplined by their own hierarchy, uh, had withstood the communist onslaught of the 1940s and 50s so that no secret service could really influence their decisions. When the, uh, is it still working? Uh, when the Gastarbeiter movement to Germany and Austria started, they managed to set up key institutions for the migrants. While many Serb migrants frequ frequented the multinational and pro-communist Yugoslav clubs, which were set up in uh, Germany and Austria, Croat workers integrated rather into the Croat Catholic parishes, which were part of German bishoprics, but which had their own priests uh, sent from the homeland. Uh, just as back home, the Catholic priests proved quite active and were, key, were keen to maintain religious discipline to prevent what they considered to be defections into the secularist Yugoslav clubs. When, on 1988, the uh, Croat national dissident Franjo Tuzman was looking for support from the numerous Croat diaspora for his nationalist program, the structure was already there and it helped him greatly to collect funds for his victorious campaign, which finally ended in Croatia's independence. And there was no considerable, there was no comparative, comparable role to that for the Serbian Orthodox Church, notwithstanding all the national credentials of his church. To make it short, uh, diaspora is worth studying Today, we do not know uh, much about uh, diaspora religious communities, how they influence their members. There is little research on this done in Germany 
uh, and I wonder why this is so. Um, since migrants in societies such as Germany are religiously uh, usually more vital than the majority population, um, uh, this role of the clergy and the diaspora communities is surely there, but we do not really know how this influence, how this influence, I tell you, looks like, looks like. Uh, but just that influence <coughs> might make a difference um, for the patterns how migrants integrate and how they communicate with their countries of origin. I think that to know more about this means to know, to know more uh, about the values or also about the value conflicts of the migrants. I think that we should research just these questions further. Thank you very much. <laughs>